In this episode of Inspirational Women, I'm chatting with Maureen Kelly. Maureen currently lives here in Birch Bay, and she um, moved to Germany while she was in university and attended another university over there. She learned German, French, and Italian, so she's fluent in three languages. Became a long distance runner while she was overseas in Europe. Did a lot of traveling, worked for a travel agency. Came back to the United States and she um, was located in Nashville for a while and then moved up here to Birch Bay where she owns a website called Sage Butterfly and she um, conducts workshops, classes, etc. on the healing practices, yoga, acupressure, um, energy, sound healing, and she also works with animals. Plus, she's an author. So I think you're really going to enjoy this one. Welcome to the next episode of Inspirational Women. Remember to subscribe to the channel and click on the bell so that you can be informed of any and all new episodes. Today we are welcoming Maureen Kelly. She is the owner of sagebutterfly.com, owner and creator of sagebutterfly.com. As per her website, I'm going to read because it's a long one, acupressure, yoga, breath work and meditation, and a lot more. <laughs> welcome, Maureen. Thank you. So welcome. But Thank you. Thank you for having me. So before we get into that, Maureen, let's just talk about, you know, where were you born and where did you spend your childhood? Born in Portland, Oregon, and um, then at the age of two, the family moved to California, and we lived, we moved to the Bay Area. So I grew up in a town called El Cerrito, California, and uh, right so I lived there until I went to college at the University of San Francisco, and um, then I don't know if you want me to keep going on that wavelength. Um, I met my to be husband there and he graduated ROTC. He was two years in front of me and we ended up getting married, <clears throat> excuse me, and moving to Germany. So he it was, uh, that unfolded a whole wow. chapter of my life. <laughs> it's, Boy, it's, yeah, yeah. There's not too many people will, will be doing that right out of college. Well, and I wasn't, I was only a sophomore. I was, I was 20 when, when we got married and it's so funny. I look back now and I didn't, I felt like I was, you know, 21, I'm grown up and I exactly. look at someone that's 21 now and it's like, oh my gosh, I was a baby, but it was, it was perfect. It all unfolded perfectly for the time. Well, it's funny how your age and the times reflect because years ago people, I mean, that was very typical to get married at 21. I was 22 when I first got married. Yeah, that's true. You know, people are waiting till they're in their late 20s and 30s and sometimes even longer I was gonna we were gonna go unmarried no daughter of mine is going to Germany or to live in Europe unmarried and so, <laughs> and so I got my courage up and I said my dad won't let me go unmarried and he said well then let's get married I said okay and so oh. it was six weeks later St. Patrick's Day we had the wedding and off we went to Europe <laughs> so it was all rather spontaneous but. quite the adventure yeah. When you were in college or in university, rather, uh, you went to the University of San Francisco and studied English. What did you think you were going to be doing with in with that degree? Well, I started out in nursing, actually, and so did I, you? I completed a year of nursing, and it was all theory the first year. And then, starting the sophomore year, we went into the hospital, and my whole body went. You know, you probably don't want to be doing this. And I knew that I loved writing, and so I thought, well, English would, and, and I love language in general. And so mm -hmm. I'll become an English major, and, you know, who knows what, maybe I'll move to L.A. and write comedy shows or something. I, I had no idea. But I also was 
in love with travel. And so at that point, I didn't want my parents spending all that money for me to be in college when I wasn't sure what I was going to do. And so I applied to some airlines. I thought I'll just go become a flight attendant and, you know, fly around and see Europe. And, and then, of course, then I met Dan and everything mm -hmm. changed and we ended up going to Europe anyway. So it all, it all worked out perfectly. And I ended up studying in Germany. I went to the German University in Erlangen and I also went to the University of Maryland on the Army Post and studied German. French and Italian and so forth. Right. How difficult was it for you to learn German? It's such a guttural. Yeah, you know, I think I'd had so many years of French and even though that's a romance language and German is nothing like it, I think once you can right. kind of get involved in the idea of another language or the grammar, because I like to learn why I'm saying something. Um, and then I was immersed in the culture. We lived um, in a little tiny German village. And so, and he, Dan was gone lots and lots and lots and field maneuvers and so I just immersed myself in the country and um, I actually picked it up quite quite readily and and it's funny when the last time I went back to visit my I call him my German brother he was laughing he goes you know it's so funny you speak with a Bayerish with a Bavarian accent <laughs> I said well this is where I learned German you know so <laughs> yeah yeah and French and Italian so you learned French while you were in the U.S. or yes. when you went to Europe Oh, like in fifth grade, I think we started with French class and then I took all four years of high school. Um, yeah, I, I loved, I loved French too. It was, it was Yeah, I was unaware that uh, French was taught, was a subject taught in high school here in the United States. Um, maybe because of the high school, I went into a, an all-girl Catholic high school in, in Berkeley, California. And I think we had the choice of Spanish or French, and I chose French, I think. I see. Yeah. And then Italian would come readily after that. They're so similar. Yeah, Italian and Spanish. I, I would, when I started speaking some Spanish, it was very confusing because Italian and Spanish are just like, but Italian, if I had to name a language that was my favorite, I just love the, the enthusiasm and the I know. and then Italian music. And so, yeah, unfortunately, I wouldn't consider myself fluent whatsoever in that, at least anymore, because I never have the chance to use it. But I love it. Yeah. Yeah. But the French are like that, too. Or the French in Montreal, where I grew up, there was a lot of hand movements. Oh, really? And, oh, gosh, yeah. So we grew up, you know, speaking with our hands. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's funny. Um, in the Myers-Briggs, if we talk about that, the extroversion, introversion thing, extroverts have a tendency to use their hands a lot, too. So when you were in Europe, you um, became interested in long-distance running and triathlons. How did that happen? You were just bored and decided, I'm going to run one day? I blame my ex-husband. I had started running every day. I mean, he was gone a lot and I, it was just something to go out and I got up to maybe doing, you know, five, six miles a day. And he said, there's a race coming up, a women's race uh, that was through the military. And he said, it's a half marathon and it's like 13 miles. And I'm like, oh, there's no way I can run 13 miles. He said, oh, yes, you can. You're doing five a day. And so he talked me into it. Remember, I was scared to death. I'd never done a race before. And here it was this uh -huh. long thing. And I ended up out of like 100 women. I think I came fifth, something like that. That's and good. like I got bit by this bug. And then it became, I would definitely, it became an obsession. I was running, oh gosh, in my longer days, I was running 60 to 70 miles a week. And then I you know, started doing half marathons and then I didn't, I've done a few full marathons, but my favorite, I liked like 20 or 21 kilometers was my favorite. But then came along triathlons and I thought, well, I'm going to try this. And um, so I was working, I mean, I was working full time for a travel agency and then I was also working out, getting up at like a five in the morning so I could go run and bike and then swim when I could and and finally, it got to the point because I was traveling on the weekends and to go where I would be racing. And first, he started coming with me. And I was doing very, very well. And so it was like more incentive uh -huh. that I'm going to keep doing this. And finally, one day, he looked at me and he said, I'm not going anymore. If you're going to keep racing, go for it. But I'm done. And he was like, I created this, didn't I? <laughs> It's like, yeah, so you, you got to see a lot of your, uh, I'm assuming all these um, races that you ran were in Europe. Yeah, they were in Europe. Yeah. So you got to see a lot of the country. I'd say the majority of the ones I did were in Germany, so I didn't have to travel too far. But if there was one that was like a championship of some sort, like maybe in Austria and, and then 
I'm trying to remember where else I was, but yeah. And then finally I, I'd kind of had it also. And it's just like, Oh, okay. I don't, I don't need to be doing this anymore. <laughs> it's just, yeah. yeah, no more. You said that you worked for a travel agency. Did you travel in your role there? Yeah. Yes, I did. It actually started out in a travel agency that was on the army post where, where Dan was stationed and, um, got my fingers wet there. I'd always wanted to work. Well, as I said, I wanted to be a flight attendant or something so I could travel and just living in Europe was like being in Disneyland for me. And so mm -hmm. when I got the opportunity, because I spoke German, um, the man that hired me was half German, half American. And he was thrilled that I, cause we had some people that would come in speaking German too. And I started out there and then a German travel agency just up the road, I met the owner of that and he said, would you come work for me? So I went to work for a German agency and um, I was in charge of uh, bus trips, which sounds like bus trips, but the German buses are like, I mean, luxury buses and they would go all over. We went to Austria for ski trips. We went to um, the, one of the ones that I was mainly in charge of were our buses to Spain in the summer. And it, it got quite confusing because you'd go to like three or four different locations to three or four different hotels. Some people staying one week, some people staying two, some mm. people staying three. So working yeah. all out and many, many times, of course, I got to go too, which was just, it was fabulous. I just really, really enjoyed that. I was with him for five years, I think, that I worked there. Uh -huh. All that travel and the experience of meeting new people all the time. Yeah. You have to be very outgoing to be able to take on a, a role like that. Uh, it helps. Yeah. Yes. And enjoy speaking to other people. Yeah. Engage them. Yeah. Be kind of yeah. Like have a tour guide that was, didn't want to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> now you returned to the United States to Nashville. What prompted that move? Actually, when we first came back, we went to Norfolk, Virginia and Dan was in the armed forces staff college. It was an invitation only type uh, uh -huh. three week long school. And the magic of that is where I was introduced to the Myers-Briggs type indicator and on to work extensively. I became certified as a, as an, uh, an MBTI consultant, but we moved from there to DC two years in Washington, DC. And I worked for Northwest airlines flying first to Germany. And then I was able to bring the Myers-Briggs into Northwest airlines. And so I would fly around the country doing Myers-Briggs workshops. Then I lost my job when they almost went bankrupt. Then we had the pleasure of moving to Clarksville, Tennessee. He was stationed at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And we were there for two years. And then he got a battalion command in Fairbanks, Alaska. And I decided I did not want to be a battalion commander's wife in Fairbanks. And so I moved to Nashville. He moved to Alaska. We thought maybe we could actually survive a long, long, long distance relationship. And <laughs> That didn't work, but what it, I think we were both kind of ready. We were so young when we got married. I think we were both kind of ready to head in our own directions. And so we're still friends and it. It's nice that you can remain friends. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And you, and I read that you worked as a web designer in, in well, Nashville. Yeah, actually that was another thing that I was like, wow, you know, it would be really neat when I was, I was doing a lot of graphics work and stuff that I did for the travel agency and, and uh -huh. When Dan got one of the very, very first Macintosh computers when we lived in Europe, and I remember I was ready to, to just throttle him because he spent so much money on this little computer, and I thought, why do we need this? And he said, he knew I was doing all my graphics work and stuff by hand. He said, give me 15 minutes. Let me sit you down and show you what you can do with this. And yeah. I thought, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And so I was doing a lot of graphics work and then that was when web design started becoming popular and I decided I wanted to learn how to do that. And so I had a, there was an agency that was a, a, a what do you call it, an internet provider um, and they did mainly office work, or I mean, worked with big businesses and stuff. And I just went and introduced myself and they hired me as a marketing person. I'm like, I don't know anything about this stuff, but okay. <laughs> so I started going to different places and trying to sell like T1s and all these things. I can't even tell you what I was really selling. What I knew what I really wanted to do was web design. And so I told the owner that I said, you know, I'd really rather, you don't have a web designer. What if I do that? And he says, well, do you know how? And I said, well, not yet, but I can learn. So yeah, I, learned, I taught myself how to do web design. And um, 
he, I worked for him doing that for about a year, and then I asked if he would be insulted if I started my own company, and he said, no, you're doing great, go for it. So started my own web design company and um, brought that with me here, as a matter of fact. That's that's what I was doing. Good. When I was here. Yeah. I'm, so what prompted your move to Birch Bay? Oh, my gosh. Linda, that was – talk about – you know, there's certain – things, episodes that happen where you can look back and you see the very moment that changed everything. I had remarried in Nashville and my, also he's an ex as well, which is a better thing. Um, <laughs> he and I decided that we were tired of living in the South because of the heat and the humidity and it, Nashville right. was starting to be harder. I love Nashville. And we wanted to move and we thought that we would go to the Seattle area. And so we made a trip to Port Townsend and and really liked it and then we decided well maybe we should try new mexico and so we made a trip to taos and while i liked taos it wasn't i knew it wasn't where i wanted to live so we had we'd only been there like two hours we're sitting in a little cafe restaurant there in the, the square of taos and our waitress comes out and she says you know we take our order and she says so where are you two from and we said well we both looked at each other we said we live in, in uh, Nashville, but we're moving to Port Townsend, Washington. We had decided that's where we were going to go. And she says, oh, she goes, I love Port Townsend. It's like, you're here in Taos as a waitress and you know Port Townsend. She goes, yeah, but she goes, have you guys tried the Bellingham area? We had never heard of the Bellingham area. So mm -hmm. we made it to Bellingham, came to Birch Bay, fell in love with Birch Bay, and ended up moving here. And But it's one of those things where if that waitress had not been working that particular oh. shift that day, I mean, it changed, it changed the whole course of my life because she was working that day. And it just, those things just amazed I, me. I truly believe that some people come into your life for a purpose. I, absolutely. And sometimes yeah. it's a 10 minute one. <laughs> yeah. Pretty amazing. Yeah. And were, were you always interested in yoga and the healing practices? In some level, healing has been a part of me for, for a long, long, long time. I mean, I can't picture or say what it was early in life. Going into that just seemed like the most natural thing in the world. And um, the yoga, I started taking yoga when I lived in Washington, DC, and I knew that I wanted to become an instructor at some point. And um, after I'd been living here for a few years, I met a woman who was an Ayurvedic pr practitioner and she taught yoga here in Birch Bay. And I was taking her classes and she asked me if I would fill in for her when she couldn't teach. And I said, well, I will, but I need to get certified. So I went ahead and got my yoga certification. And she ended up leaving the, and going somewhere else. Oh, she started an Ayurvedic store in Bellingham. And um, so I took over for her, for her with her classes. And so I've been uh, teaching now, my gosh, 12 years, I guess, 13 years. I don't even know how many years. That's how yeah. long you've been here in Birch Bay? Oh, no, I've been here for 21 years now, almost. Yeah, oh, 20 I see. Years. No, 20, I 20 see. years. Yeah. And then how did that, you know, how did you become interested in applying that technique with animals? Oh, the acupressure? Yes. Sorry, yeah. acupressure. Yes. Uh, no, you know what? That makes me to explain the yoga that I teach. Um, I call chakra yoga. And, and I know you wanted mm -hmm. to talk about that, the energy fields in the body. And so that I started the, the whole acupressure and the sound and I'll expand on that. But I, I met a man through, um, he became a teacher of mine, um, Stephen Russell. He went by the, the name Barefoot Doctor. And I discovered him in about 2009, I guess. And he was from the Taoist tradition and he was an acupuncturist and a sound healer. And I was just so taken with what he was teaching and how he taught it and the whole world of energy. And um, he is the one that inspired me to get my uh, certification in acupressure and in sound. And mm -hmm. so that's why the yoga that I teach incorporates all of that. It's kind of a unique mm -hmm. blend. Uh, it's not your normal yoga class, I would say. <laughs> I see. And and you created the, the um, website called... Um, Sage Butterfly. How, is there a significance to the name? You know, that's one of the things that I have no idea where it came from. I, I loved the whole idea of a butterfly and metamorphosis and change and, and, and uh -huh. realize we all go through that several times in life. And I thought, well, what what would go with that? And, and I guess I just thought, you know, it's a very wise inner knowing 
that when we change and we shift and so the word sage and I love the color sage as well and it was just like out of somewhere it was like sage butterfly it was like okay that's what I'll call it but I really it, it, it yeah it just is one of those things that pops in your head and it's like okay I was wondering if it had a significance of any kind so now you're conducting workshops classes etc and let's talk now about those healing practices which when I was researching, oh my gosh, there's just so much to research on this topic. What are chakras? Chakra, um, well in Sanskrit it means wheel or disc, and chakras are energy fields that we each have in our bodies, and there's many, many, but the seven main chakras that are usually right. start at the base of the spine, go to the sacral, the solar plexus, the heart, the throat, the third eye, and the crown. And mm -hmm. each of them in turn has a specific color um, and then specific attributes that they that they bring, um, whether it's grounding or creation or power, or love, uh, authenticity, um, intuition, and then our connection to a higher power. And so mm -hmm. um, we can be out of balance in one or many. Um, and so with the yoga that I teach, what we do is we go into a different energy field each week and, and foot bring our focus there. And so it's, um, yeah, it's, it's one of those things of trusting that we are more than just these physical beings that there's, we are in fact, energy ourselves since what is it? 99.9% .9 space. Right. Um, and I love the thing. It's like, well, then why doesn't my butt fall through the chair <laughs> if I'm full of energy? But uh, <laughs> so, I, yeah, that just, that whole idea of being energy and therefore being malleable, you know, our thoughts are energy, our words are energy. And if we can become truly aware of that, that we become a lot more cognizant, uh, not only when we're communicating with another, but mainly when we're communicating with ourselves. And, and I think we start to realize how often, you know, we need to stop and say, okay, where am I going with that? Because that's what I'm perpetuating. And so that's, that's one of the reasons I love teaching this is to bring people into that space of knowing, of realizing how powerful they really are in their own words and their own thoughts and energy. So. I agree with that. You are who you think you are. Uh, oh, amen. Yeah. Yes. Now, when I was researching uh, yesterday, I came across this article that said, well, it said a lot of things, but you know that it, the whole idea of chakras was passed down from before Christ. It's that old. Oh, oh, I'm sure it is, you know, and, and yeah. it's an Ayurveda tradition and yeah, the Sanskrit and Indian and yeah. yeah. And I just kn know that there are many, many more, many fields and then there's what they call nadis, which are points of energy yeah. that are very, very similar actually to acupressure points. So I think if, if we looked at the big picture, it would just be the absolute knowing that we are energy and that there are different fields, there are different channels, like in, in acupressure or acupuncture, we've got the meridians of energy also that also then correspond because it all kind of works together, you know, so I I think in, in maybe rather than making it too complicated, just that knowing that um, that we're malleable through our thoughts and our words and actions and um, our words. So, so how do you know when you're working with someone if one of their chakras is out of balance? I can sometimes tell through acupressure, just um, ah might be getting more more energy or in need of more energy. And then a lot through just the communication with, with, with my client, you know, where they can tell me, you know, where are you feeling out of balance? You know, um, it, not just physically, but emotionally, you know, what, mm -hmm. like if it's somebody that's that's feeling really stuck because they, they aren't able to express themselves, you know, and, and maybe that expression is, they can't because it's out of fear. And if it's out of fear, typically it's gonna be a sacral chakra area. And then, of course, the throat chakra would be affected as well if you're holding back from that. So I like to get some information both physically and emotionally what's going on in someone's life. And then um, it becomes pretty easy to pinpoint where, you know, where we need to do the work as far as bringing some. How do you help your client to recover or using the chakras? Is that when you start using acupressure? Um, if it's a one-on-one, -on -one, we'll, we'll do acupressure. Sometimes we'll do yoga together and, you know, we'll mm -hmm. work on, like, as I said, each week I, I switch into a different chakra 
And um, so between the sound and the acupressure, sound being vibration itself as well, um, and then giving them something that they can they can take with them so that they can they can practice and and a lot of people um, so this is I find interesting have a difficult time with the sound people a lot of times are afraid to use their own voice and I I really believe that probably 80 to 90 percent of our population is out of uh, balance in the throat chakra um, mm -hmm. and it's usually also because of fear of what will people think, or I'm not good enough, or who cares, <laughs> you know, and it's, this is so important, I think, for people to realize their own value and to feel heard. And I think many, many people yeah. do not. That was my next topic, sound healing. How do you help someone in that respect with sound? Um, typically, usually, there, there's a few different ways. I uh, work with the sounds of the chakras. They each have a different, what's called a Sanskrit seed sound. And when we make that sound, it resonates in that particular energy field. So working with that, um, and then usually it's more than one. I do something I call chakra play. Uh, just let me give you an example. Uh, maybe the person that came, comes to me that's, that's fearful, so they're out of balance in their sacral chakra, and they're also out of balance as far as expressing themselves. So the sacral chakra down in the, the belly, lower belly region, kidney area, um, is the seed sound of VAM, V like victory, A-M. And the seed sound for the throat is HAM, H-A-M. So what I would have them do is tone, and I've made like hand motions. So we're bringing a lot of different energy into it. The hand motion for the sacral chakra is just like making little waves. It's the element of water. So they would be doing the sound of VAM. And then the hand motion for the throat is Padme Mudra it's, that I've that I have call it. I mean, I've kind of made these things up, not Padre Mudra, but how to use them. And uh -huh. that's bringing the, the heels of the hands, the thumbs and the pinkies together and holding it right in front of the throat space, this lotus flower in front of your throat. And this is the seed sound of hum, H-A-M. So they would be going between hum, 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 and, and maybe six times or whatever going back and forth. So you're taking that energy of releasing the fear up into the authenticity of your throat chakra and then taking that back down so you're getting this energy flow going and then we would come into an affirmation of something like um when when i release fear from my being i'm able to fully express myself or that's just off the top mm -hmm. of my head you know whatever it is to to really take what the messages of doing this sound work and and then give it a name and be able to say that and 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 repeat that and take that energy and and go with mm -hmm. it yeah, I'm a big believer in positive affirmations also. On to healing of animals, healing practices for animals. Is that would be mainly the acupressure? Yeah, main, mainly the acupressure. They are so receptive, you know, they, they don't have yeah. the emotional blocks that we have with, um, you know, either not believing it or I don't know, whatever we think when, when we do something like that, they're just extremely, they're like little energy sponges. My golden, yeah. instance, he lets me do acupressure and he just loves it. And, and, um, so that's, yeah, I, I don't have tons of opportunity to do that, especially now because people right. come with their animals, but, um, I, I like to share if somebody writes to me and they say, you know, my animal has, lower back pain or something that I can send them some acupressure points that they can do themselves on their pet. And, mm -hmm. and there's a woman named um, Linda Tellington Jones, and I'm not certified in T-Touch, but she does something called T-Touch. And she started with horses and then she moved into animals and actually with people as well. And she has a quote and I don't have it in front of me, but it is, or it's that knowing that my fingers are communicating with the cells in your body and it's telling them basically you are perfect you are mm -hmm. and that trust you know that trust that that mm -hmm. you're switching the changing the energy and and animals are just obviously so receptive because they don't have nearly as many blocks as as we tend to have but they want to please you oh absolutely yeah the cats maybe mm -hmm. not so much <laughs> My cat. Even. Apparently so. I don't know. I've never owned a cat, but we've owned. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty independent. Uh, are most of your clients, what age group are they in? Are they older? Are they younger? Or do you have a mix? There's a mix. I'd say like from my yoga students that I have many that are that are older. And I think, uh -huh. I think 
of yoga, while we do definitely move our bodies and do different things, it's more of a gentle yoga. I mean, we're not out there, you know, doing power stuff. Uh-huh. We do our sun salutes and we raise our heart great with that. But uh-huh. for the most part, somebody that would have some challenges would probably be able to do most of my yoga. Or if not, I give them ways that they can modify it. So I'd say, I mean, I do, as I said, some younger, some middle, but the majority, the greatest percentage are people that are older. Do you find that, well, I'm speaking about women, maybe men too, that as we get older, do we have, do most people have more confidence or less confidence? Wow, that's a good question. Um, I would think more because I think we become less self-conscious as we get older. Yeah. And, And it's like, when we're on throat chakra, I love using the the quote, you know, this, this isn't a dress rehearsal, you know, this is your life. And so yeah. what is it that you want and choose to do now? So I, I would say, I would say they get less self-conscious. So I was just thinking at my age, do you do reflect at times, especially when I was doing this research and I was thinking, you know, I have a lot more confidence now than I did when I was in my twenties or thirties and mm-hmm. I think you're willing to take more chances in life, ex- you know, just experiment more than when you were younger. That's just my opinion, of course. And, and obviously not everybody is like that, but I think they're missing out if they're not. Yeah. And maybe that's a good time to start talking about Myers-Briggs. Oh. Hmm. Yeah. When I, years ago, when I worked for, I think it was Bell Canada, I can't remember where I was working at the time, we encountered this and they had somebody come in and, you know, there was the four types. Um, It it was in broken into, the chart I remember was broken into to four. Oh, there's four pairs that make up 16 types. Four pairs. Yeah, where you can yeah make- because you have a combination, right? You're introverted or extroverted, and then there's others which I don't remember. Mm-hmm. Um, so either uh, the introverted or extroverted, and and it's always interesting to explain this to somebody because you meet, might meet someone that is an I, an introvert in Myers Briggs terms, and you're sitting next to them on a plane and they talk your ear off, but by the time you get off the plane, you know nothing about them. I mean, all they talk. <laughs> Uh, just like Johnny Carson, here he was in front of millions of yes. people every day. He was a total introvert, you know. Um, yes. And then uh, an extrovert, um, they spell it differently in the Jungian. It's X E X T R A instead of O. And it's mainly that one where you get your energy. Are you energized about around being around people and sharing, or do you tend to get depleted by that and need your alone time? And and it shifts. I, I'm convinced from everything I've learned. I've worked with it now for oh my god, over 30 years. I don't know how many years. That we that your Myers Briggs type. If you answer it honestly, that does not change. I, I have actually think if you believe in past lives that we probably take that with us through through our lifetimes and but it does it can shift as far as like I'm I'm an extrovert but I now have become much more introverted as far as really just liking my my own alone time but I still need to you know be able to share I need to be able to share mm-hmm. and and then the, the sensing intuition the second line is whether you're more into the sensing world of the five senses or if you're more into the intuitive world and taking it into that sixth sense into the world of possibilities versus the world of facts and then mm-hmm. the third letter, the T and the F, thinking, feeling, somebody that makes their decisions more, this is the decision-making mode, based on logic or based on feelings, based on more sub- subjective versus objective. And then mm-hmm. the last one, the J and the P, the judging and perceiving our lifestyle. Are we very orderly? Like when I first moved into my condo, my cupboards, it was just like it was so hard to see anything. So I bought some of those Lazy Susan things, mm-hmm. and I was so happy that my partner he lives next door he came over and I kept making him look and look and I would spin them and stand back it was like everything is so orderly you know for me I just like things to be orderly and the p the perceiver on the other hand is like oh my gosh you know you're you're basically nuts who cares you know and yeah so that yeah it's 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 really fun to to delve into that and see why there might be miscommunication <laughs> right Right. Yeah. I just find it fascinating. I really do. And, and, and also I think that you can be some of all of those things at 
different parts of the day or different parts of your life? Yeah, yeah. I think, again, I think that we maintain our four letter profile pretty mm-hmm. much um, through a lifetime. But yeah, depending on, like, for instance, at one workshop I taught, a woman came up to me and she was an extroverted, sensing, feeling judger. But that particular time, she felt she came out introverted rather than extroverted. And she said, I don't understand. I've filled this out like four times in my life. I've never been introverted. And I said, well, Mm -hmm. there's something going on in your life. Has something a major happened? She said, yes, my husband passed away about three months ago. Uh, You know, your body, your spirit is asking you to draw within. I said, but you're still an extrovert. I mean, that's that's who you are. But our bot, depending on what's happening in our lives, we can, you know, shift. If you're under tremendous stress, you can tend to really flip flop. And like somebody that's a J that's always very orderly might all of a sudden be, you know, throwing it, you know, everything around and not giving a poop about what's going on usually that's what you see when someone's under stress they go completely to the opposite so you are an author you've authored five books Mm -hmm. wow let's talk about those chakra play chakra play is the one that when i was describing using the sound and the hand motions um i wrote that one i wanted to put that into a book form and so that was, was, I think, I don't know, third book I wrote. It's been several years since that one came out. Um, let's see, then Energy Types, which uh-huh. is favorite, that, in, that integrates the whole Myers-Briggs area. And Myers-Briggs uh-huh. and looking at the chakras. So if you know your, your Myers-Briggs type, you can have an idea of which chakra might most easily go out of balance. And so I incorporated knowing that and how to how to kind of go back and forth between those two systems and bring balance and the others the others i think the very first one i wrote was called wine types personality and type and what i did is i looked at Mm -hmm. wine varietals and and what uh what the varietal like the cabernet how it's grown and that tends to be more sj and myers-briggs and i just champagne is more the free spirit and so just kind of a kind of a fun book and sort of tongue in cheek, but also with, you know, I did do research as far as the varietals and how like Pinot Noir would be more of an NT in which the NTs in Myers-Briggs, they're the perfectionists. Everything has to be not just so from it being neat, but just so as, as NTs can tend to be kind of, they know it all. And, and the Pinot Noir is the same way. It's very picky. It's very choosy about the terrain and the temperature and everything else. And so the mm-hmm. NTs so I just kind of took that and had fun with it in, in wine types. And then I did the same thing with pet types. I wrote one about book, a book about animals and, and what types they might be. And uh, gosh, what else? Oh, my pocket gurus. I wrote a book that uses affirmations and I make these little drawings. They just kind of, I'm not sure where they came from. I like to say they were inspired by John Lennon because I love him and... and mm-hmm. And he, he did little drawings and I just started making these drawings and it was like they were alive. And so I put together a book with my little pocket guru drawings and an affirmation, a word and an affirmation that was associated. And you could open it like an oracle just to see whatever the, the oh. for the day. Yeah. That sounds fun. And, what, and something about note cards. You've got note cards. Um, I have made greeting cards that incorporate usually the, the pocket gurus. So maybe right. yeah, whatever it would be a word like, um, breathe, <laughs> but people tend to like that one, breathe. And then the pocket guru on the, on the front that, that is representative of the breathe. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, and you did mention that you have another one that is going to be released soon. Is that correct? My book, yes. And yeah. oh, I, I don't know why I'm procrastinating on it because it's actually written. It's um, it's called Pocket Gurus. It's going to incorporate my little figures again. Pocket Gurus Morning Guidance. And it's a little prayer or thought or whatever you want to call it for each day of the year. And it's, it's, um, it's about coming into gratitude, um, just taking even a minute or two in the morning to center yourself in gratitude for the day. And I've been keeping a morning journal now for years and years and years where each morning I, I write something, a little prayer, or something I'm grateful for. And I thought, you know, for people that either don't want to write or 
aren't drawn to do that themselves. Maybe it would be nice if they had something that they could just look at when they get up in the morning and have a positive thought and an idea to take with them for the day. So it's, yeah, it's all just basically I have to design the cover and mm -hmm. the ISBN number and I'm, I'm ready to roll and I don't know quite why I've been procrastinating <laughs> about it. But yeah, it'll get and, and how can people find these books? Are they just on your website or are they on Amazon or where are they? Right now they're just on my website. I need, I really need to get some more copies printed. The, the new one will be on Amazon when it comes out. I'm, I'm figuring mm -hmm. For having that one out, I'm hoping by um, spring sometime. That's my goal. So, and oh, then good at that point, I'm going to try and get the other ones back up on Amazon too. So, Maureen, where do you see yourself or and your business um, in another five or ten years? Do you think you'll still be here in Birch Bay? You know, probably. I've lived here longer than anywhere I've ever gone, and it's it's hard to find anywhere that has this beauty, mountains and water and everything True. offered here um i'd be surprised if i if i don't stay here um i probably will still be teaching yoga because i love it so much um I mm -hmm. you know we never know what's going to happen do we? Uh, no, oh my gosh are you involved in the uh, blaine or birch bay community in any way maureen um no i was part of the chambers for years and years and years um mm -hmm few years I've just been more kind of on doing my own thing um so you know at some point maybe I'll get involved in the chamber again um it just it seems I'm not sure why I kind of pulled back from that but I mean I do try to support my community in many other ways but um maybe I felt like I I paid my dues <laughs> I don't know uh, so yeah, yeah that can happen that can happen well it's good I like that you've contributed to your community I think that's important as we get older Oh, absolutely. Like my classes, I, I, I really feel this is, I just so love sharing what I teach and, and helping to bring people, especially right now, where it, things are just kind of very stressful to be able to mm -hmm. help and be there for people in a way that they can find some peace of mind right now. So that's mm -hmm. so important. So when this pandemic is over, or even prior to the pandemic, were you teaching in a specific location or all remotely? Um, no, no, I was teaching through the Birch Bay Park and Blaine Park and Rec. Um, oh, yeah. Both here in Birch Bay, as well as the, the uh, what do you call it, the pavilion in Blaine. And right. When it, it's safe to teach, I will definitely go back to doing in-person classes. But I'm also, it's been a real pleasure to teach by Zoom. So I have people that come, some from England and California. And um, so I'm right. probably going to upkeep, maybe split it in half, do half in person and half by Zoom. That's That's my plan. Yeah. Yeah, and it's able to have acupressure clients again, which will be nice. <laughs> Can't do yeah, that. and wh where would you do that at your in I'll your do, home? I do that right out of my condo. Yeah, yeah. Oh, set up my yeah. massage table and and yeah. just do it right here. So, yeah. Well, it's been a pleasure talking with you today, Maureen. Thank you. I enjoyed Thank it. Thank, Thank you for joining me. Thank you for, for having me, and um, I look forward to continuing our conversation in other ways.